Many people who've used RGB signals with classic consoles and arcade boards have heard warning that high voltage could damage any equipment that you use with it, especially on things like the sync line. Well, audio voltage can be equally as damaging, if not worse. So this video is going to show you how to use an oscilloscope to test audio voltage to make sure it's safe to use on all your home equipment. In this video, I'll be showing my Rigel scope that's previously been set up to test video. From here, there's only a few changes needed, but if your scope was configured differently, you might need to change a few more things. First, I'll be connecting the probe directly to the scope. We'll want the probe set to 10x, so we'll need to set the scope to match that as well. Then, we'll need to set the trigger to whatever input we just connected the probe to. We'll use channel 1 in this example. Next, we'll use the horizontal and vertical adjustment knobs to set the scope to about 2 volts and 10 milliseconds. We'll probably tweak this as the signals start to come in, though. The last setting to tweak is in the display menu and sets the persist time to infinite. This will allow the maximum signal to always be retained on the screen. Finally, we need to connect the probe to the audio channel that has a load on it. We accomplished that here by using a receptacle RCA connector that has a 100k resistor going from signal to ground. This allows for some easy places to attach a probe to the signal. Then we connected the probe to the main signal pin between the pin and resistor, then attached ground to the RCA shell. Ok, now that we're all set up, let's test a console as a reference point. I'll be using a Genesis 3 with a Sega Triple Bypass mod installed. We'll just use a SCART breakout cable and plug one of the RCA connectors directly into the RCA adapter I showed before. Now let's just power on the console and let the Sonic Attract mode play. You can see the spikes persist on the screen showing the likely maximum voltage, so let's try and get this centered. After it's centered, move the trigger to the center of the signal as best you can. As a note, the moment you change a setting or recenter the image, you'll clear the screen of any persistent data, so make sure to center everything before you're ready to measure. Now that it's centered and the trigger is set, we'll just let the attract mode play a bit. Luckily the sonic attract modes show actual gameplay, so it's a real-time measurement. Of course, using test software that plays each sound channel at its full volume would be best, but that's just not a realistic expectation for most equipment. Ok, now let's measure. First, let's press stop on the scope to hold our measurement in place. Now we can press the cursor button, set the measurements to horizontal, and see what the voltage is. On this scope, we always use B to A to get the proper result. As we can see here, we now have a measurement of the audio voltage this console outputs. Anything under 3.3 volts should be safe and within SCART specs, but it's totally ok if it's lower. High voltages can introduce clipping and equipment with less dynamic range, so lower voltages are not only acceptable, but preferred. Especially with audio, it's simple to just turn your TV's volume up a couple notches to compensate. So now that we've shown some examples of how to measure, let's test some arcade boards and see how we can make sure that their audio voltage is safe to use. We'll kind of do the opposite of what we just showed. Rather than set the scope to measure the console's output, We'll set the scope to our target voltage and adjust the game to it. All the settings are pretty much the same, except we'll set the cursors on the scope each to my target voltage of about 1.5 volts above and center them for a total of 3 volts peak to peak. Now we can watch the image and adjust the boards to fit within that range. I'll start with The Simpsons as it has volume pots soldered directly to the board. As you can see, this is outputting a lot of voltage and we have to turn the volume almost all the way down. Now let's recenter to clear the image and slowly raise the volume until it almost fills the measurements. To ensure good performance, I strongly recommend setting the volume lower than my 3 volt limit. This way if other parts of the game have audio spikes, we have enough extra headroom before we hit the limit. You can do the same thing with games that have volume control in their service menu. Here's MK4 and we can see that setting it to around 30% is safest on this board. I strongly recommend making a note of the setting, either by marking the pots with a sharpie or by leaving a sticky note on the arcade board, reminding of what the audio should be set to. If you have an arcade board with a removable pot, you can permanently set it to line level and never worry about it again. Here's a Mortal Kombat 1 board which uses that exact same setup. 
Using the method I just showed, we were able to find a setting that's in a safe voltage range. So now we'll just use a multimeter to measure the exact resistance that the pot was set to at the safe voltage. It looks like it's just under 10K, so we could just add a 10K of resistance to a wire and build it right into the same style connector that the pot uses. As a note, no two arcade boards are the same. I also tested this on a second MK1 board and it required slightly more resistance than the first. I was able to get both to output safe, line level compatible voltage, but it's not as easy as just saying, use a 12K resistor on MK1. You'll need to test and adjust each one individually. I hope this video was a decent guide on how to test your own audio voltage, but much more importantly, I hope that it was a reminder of how dangerous audio voltages can be, and especially when using arcade boards. While console owners almost never need to worry about audio, most super guns offer zero protection on the audio circuit, so almost every arcade board user needs to pay close attention. There's a few super guns that do include protection though, such as the minigun and the Haas version 4.0 or later. With these, the arcade board volume never goes above 3.3 volts. I mean, if you raise the volume too high, it'll clip and sound awful, but at least you won't have to worry about damaging any equipment. If you have a scope, I still strongly recommend calibrating each board though, just to ensure it's both safe and not clipping. Since pretty much everything I know about scopes were taught to me by Steve from HD Retrovision, I asked him to come and answer a few questions to help clarify some stuff about audio testing and basically just about overvoltage and audio in general. So here's Steve to answer some of our questions. Okay, Y cables. So Y cables, you have two main scenarios. You have um, when dealing with audio, like RCA line level audio. So you have the situation where you have a mono output driving a uh, stereo input, so you have one going to two things, so that's like splitting. And the uh, alternate scenario is you have a stereo output driving a mono input, so you have two outputs driving a single input, so that's more like combining. So the splitting is easier to think about so you have one output that's meant to drive a relatively high impedance, resistance, whatever. Um, and, and we were emulating it with 100K resistors, so think of that. So if, if you split it so it drives two inputs, so 200K resistors, you kind of get like 50, which is still within the normal um, operating parameters of the mono output it can drive they can probably even drive a few more inputs not just the two but uh, it's totally fine um, no issues there uh, the alternate scenario is a little harder to think about when you're going from uh, stereo output to mono input um, I, I guess the the concern what I've heard is that uh, if you think about it like at a surface level you have let's say your audio is calibrated to three volts like we was discussed in the video so you have a three volt and a three volt signal and then you combine them into one uh, do you get a six volt signal um, and the answer is no and the best way i thought of the best analogy i could think of is if you have two batteries, let's say two AA batteries. Uh, and AA batteries are around 1.5 volts. And so there's there's two scenarios uh, with cooking two AA's. Um, this would be in parallel, right? If you're analogous to a Y cable, you're, you're kind of hooking up two signals in parallel. So with the batteries, they'll be in parallel. I mean, there's two ways to hook them up. You hook them up uh, where the polarities match, and then when the polarities are reversed. And those are the two extremes so if their polarities are the same you still get 1.5 volts right everybody does this your portable equipment your toys that you've used for a long time uh, a lot of them do this where they combine two double a's to get longer life it can supply the power longer it's the same voltage so you still get 1.5 volts with two double a's together like this um, they don't combine to get three volts you have to put them in series to do that uh, which is totally different. Same with the Y cable combining. 
Um, if he, your uh, Mortal Kombat arcade board was tuned to three volts, uh, or uh, that's not a stereo game, but think of some sort of stereo output that was tuned to three volts on left channel, tuned to three volts on the right channel, combine them, the max you're going to get is three. Um, it's the same kind of uh, uh, thought pattern, the, the same kind of uh, physics happens there that, that it does with the battery. So um, nothing to worry about there, is lo the, especially on the, the input that what you're driving into, it's not going to see more than it would have with just a single uh, output. If you just connected left into the mono input, it would be the same if you combined left and right into the mono input. The only thing that I can think of that might uh, not always be correct is if the outputs themselves weren't designed properly. They're supposed to have some kind of series resistance uh, on the outputs such that when you do the combining that the, the outputs kind of like match uh, they're kind of well matched so one doesn't overtake the other. If you didn't have anything there, then they'd kind of be shorting into each other. Uh, but usually there's like a, at least 100 ohms, maybe more, a couple hundred ohms on each of the left and the right. So that when you do it like a combining with a wide after, no problem. Okay, so the resistor. Uh, so there's two reasons, well, there's two justifications for including the resistor in this measurement setup. Uh, the, f the first justification is it's kind of re related to how the video, we include the 75 ohm termination. Uh, it's to emulate what a TV or other video device would have on its inputs. Uh, so with the audio, it's a similar a circumstance except it's not as specific uh, so if you go around and measure various RCA audio inputs with a multimeter uh, you know unplug a TV or whatever and then measure the resistance you'll find that it's kind of going to range between 10k and 100k and that's kind of where this 100k came from where it's it's low enough such that you're still uh, you're still uh, emulating like a real world scenario, but it's high enough such that you're not affecting the measurement too much because the lower that resistance goes, the lower the voltage is going to show up on your oscilloscope. So uh, I think that the 100K is kind of like the sweet spot uh, for the, these types of measurements. The other justification is that audio signals are they're called AC coupled. They're usually AC coupled, which means they're the, there's a capacitor in line, which blocks all the DC content. Because with audio, your uh, audio signals eventually generate uh, variations in air pressure. You know, when put through a speaker, and just having a flat line with no vibrations doesn't get you any audio. So they typically block that out. And uh, if you have a capacitor in line with your signal you need some kind of load on the other end for that whole circuit to kind of operate properly uh, to, to properly block out that DC. So if you didn't have like your termination resistor on the other end and you just measured it floating or open or just relied on the, uh, the high like one mega ohm, 10 mega ohm input uh, resistance of your oscilloscope, then your signal on your oscilloscope is not going to be symmetric around zero and it's going to kind of be shifted upward usually. Uh, similar to in the video, there is a plot of measuring the audio straight off the uh, JAMA connector of the arcade board and it was just swinging between zero and 12 volts because there's no AC uh, coupling capacitor on there. And so that's the second justification to make sure that AC, AC coupling network kind of operates properly so you know what you're looking at at the scope is correct. Um, so that's the reason for the resistor. Okay, the three volt level limit. So you're not gonna just pull up a spec sheet and grab this three volt number out of there. You, you, you kind of need to reason through to arrive at this number. And so you need a starting point. And most people would, you know, just think, okay, Google it, try to find more information because line level audio is a well-defined uh, specification, right? 
not even close. So stuff you find on Wikipedia, not reliable. So a good starting point, I believe, is the uh, SCART spec, which uh, actually lists on this audio line a 2-volt RMS audio, maximum audio limit. And so 2-volt RMS, if you assume uh, sine waves, it's around 5.6, 5.7 volts peak to peak. So 5.7 volts peak to peak, good starting point. Uh, another place to go to is the, the types of equipment you're generally going to interface uh, together. So uh, with a lot of these old consoles, they're powered by 5 volts. Uh, the majority of those actually have their audio circuitries powered by 5 volts. So that's the maximum uh, they can go is 5 volts. So if you're going to interface that into some device, the, the input device needs to support that range. And so um, I, I, it's my opinion that a well-designed device you know, knows this already about the types of equipment needs to go in it. So it, even if it doesn't support uh, a 5 volt range, it knows to ex expect 5 volts and squeeze that down into its own internal dynamic range or whatever. But that's in a perfect world, and we don't live in a perfect world. So I think it's prudent to, since we have control over adjusting these volume knobs, to aim for something a little lower. Um, and it's at this point, you know, we're talking about like a couple volts, so it's not really a safety thing, we're more of a performance thing. Because if if we can't fit in the dynamic range of the end equipment, then you're you're really just like kind of clipping these peaks uh, you're doing you're going to get clipping distortion you know with typical audio so let's aim for something lower and uh, to, to try and avoid clipping slash performance issues and then at the end we just turn up our uh, our audio knobs or a couple notches up on the TV uh, so it, it, in the end it's, it's not that big of a deal so it, it, it's better to aim for something lower and it's not like video where you're to, to adjust, you need to throw up some test patterns and adjust the contrast, saturation, brightness. It's really just slightly turning up your audio. And it's not going to be a big turn. Like if you uh, have one type of device at 3 volts and it goes in and you take an, another type of device, 1.5 volts, um, that's half the voltage. But it, you're not going to have to crank it up all the way because audio is kind of done in decibels and db and so the, the the interface designers on tvs and stuff know this and so they have usually their scale in db so you, you, a doubling of voltage doesn't mean a doubling of db it's only a few db so you just got to turn your uh, audio up slightly to compensate for like a double or having a voltage so it's not a big deal just aim for lower so you avoid clipping and uh, just turn your volume up a couple notches to compensate. It's not a big deal.